Welcome to First Chapter Friday. My name is Lucy and the book that I will be reading, the first chapter of today is called Wild Oak and this is by C.C. Harrington. Wild Oak is a story that takes place in England. The year is 1963 and it is the story of a girl named Maggie. Maggie has a really bad stutter that she's very self-conscious about and she works really hard to keep silent at school so that nobody will know this about her and make fun of her about it. Her father's not kind to her about her stutter either. He thinks it's something that needs to be fixed and he wants to send her away to a special school to do this. Maggie really does not want to do this. Maggie is someone who loves animals. She has these small pets, mice and a spider that she takes care of and she can talk without a stutter to those animals. Her mother helps strike a compromise, which ends up being that instead of going away to a school, Maggie will go live with her grandfather and he lives near a forest called the Wild Oak Forest. At the same time that Maggie is going to live with her grandfather, there is a snow leopard that has been adopted as a pet and then released and finds itself in Wild Oak. The chapters of this book alternate between Maggie's point of view and the snow leopard's point of view. So we get some first person accounts of what the snow leopard is thinking and how different the world is and how scared it is and alone and doesn't have anyone to speak up for it and protect it. The forest, Wild Oak, is also in danger of being developed. And so the story is really about how Maggie and the snow leopard can find their voices and help each other and then can they help the forest as well. So I will now read the first chapter of Wild Oak. There's a short prologue before the first chapter and I'm going to read that as well. The book is dedicated to all children who stutter, to all who speak for the animals, and all who speak for the trees. It starts with a quote, only if we understand can we care, only if we care we will help, only if we help shall all be saved. And that is Dr. Jane Goodall in her book, 40 Years at Gombe. Prologue. Wild Oak Forest was whisper still, spiderwebs glistened in the half light, dipped in frost, soft white snowflakes drifted down without a sound, badgers huddled deep in their sets. A tawny owl swooped between the black and white branches, quiet as a ghost. And deep beneath the layers of fresh white snow and rich brown earth, the ancient trees spoke to one another. There were a tapestry of roots and veins, no finer than a spool of gossamer thread. Then something happened in the forest that had never happened there before and would never happen there again. A van drove slowly down the lane, headlights groping through the whirling snow. A man got out, his leather shoes skidded along the ice-packed lane. He peered at the silhouettes of the tall trees and nodded. This will do, he said, his breath melting into wisps. Then he switched on a flashlight and opened up the back of the van. He unlocked a cage, a cage that had no business carrying what it carried. Chapter one, February, 1963, London, England. Maggie pressed the tip of one finger against the point of her pencil. It was keen and sharp, but was it sharp enough? Surely, her stomach felt hollow and shaky inside. In fact, everything felt shaky, even her legs. She rolled the yellow pencil between her thumb and forefinger. She flipped and twisted it, tapping one end against the surface of her desk. It was the only way out. Hilary Muir was next. She started reading at the top of page 32, second paragraph, fourth sentence in. Her voice was crisp and light. It flowed like music. Maggie bit her lip. If she could just get through the first line without stuttering, maybe the rest would follow and then she could put away the pencil. No, she would block, she was bound to. Some of the words would come out fine, and then suddenly they wouldn't. The air would catch, her head would jerk around, her mouth would lock open, she would blink repeatedly, and every single person in the room would stare and laugh. She squeezed her eyes shut, laughing mouths and pointing fingers crowded in. She couldn't bear it, and then everyone would know, and she would have to move schools again. She opened her eyes and glanced around. The classroom windows were locked. The door was closed. Old radiators clinked along the bare cream walls. The air was hot and stuffy. Louisa Walker sat on her right, listening, reading, following along with her ruler. 
They had never really talked, but she had always seemed kind. Maybe this time would be different, Maggie thought desperately. Maybe Louisa wouldn't laugh, or Nicola. Nicola Robinson was kind, too. Lots of people were kind. There was a pause, a shuffling of feet, the rustling of pages. Thank you, Hillary. Well read. Beautiful, in fact. Margaret Stevens, please start at the bottom of page 34. Miss Bryant's voice sounded muffled and far away as it drifted across the classroom. Margaret, she repeated, a stifled giggle. Somebody was laughing already, and she hadn't even opened her mouth. Maggie could feel the wool of her sweater tight around her neck. Margaret Stevens, are you listening to me? She stared down at the page, at the printed words, curling, pointed, full of sharp edges, like a mouthful of fish hooks. Miss Bryant's question hung in the air. Everyone was staring now, waiting for her to start. It's the only way out. Maggie's heart thudded against her ribcage. She gripped the pencil. She pulled it back. Now, she drove the keenly sharpened point deep down into the soft part of her left hand. She let out a gasp of shocked pain. Tears scalded her cheeks. Unsteadily, she rose to her feet and held up her hand. The pencil protruded from it like a grotesque oversized splinter. She trembled. Beads of scarlet blood escaped from the wound and dropped to the floor. Oh my goodness, Margaret, what on earth just happened? Are you all right? Quickly, you're excused. Get yourself to Nurse Nora right away. Go. Maggie ran out of the classroom, ignoring the sweep of horrified and disgusted faces. Nobody was laughing now. She kept running, holding her own hand, footsteps echoing along the corridors of a Southern primary. But more than the pain, she felt a rush of relief. Nurse Nora was a large, plump woman with small eyes, a navy blue uniform, and starched white cap. She moved with a cumbersome gait from one side of the room to the other. Margaret Stevens, again? What is it this time? Maggie looked down. She held out her hand without saying anything. <gasps> well, how on earth did that happen? Speak up, child. Maggie continued to look down. Her excuses for being sent out had been getting more and more extreme. There was no point in trying to explain. Nurse Nora of all people would never understand. You've been in here six times in three weeks. It's not normal, Nurse Nora sighed deeply. You're almost 12 years old, Margaret. You can't possibly be this clumsy all the time. Silence. Nurse Nora glared. Maggie swallowed hard. It really hurt now, the throbbing in her hand. So once again, you've got nothing to say for yourself. What a surprise. Maggie stared at the toes of her shoes. She had not polished them and they were scuffed and worn looking. Why couldn't people see that none of this was a choice? She didn't choose to stutter. It wasn't a question of trying harder or breathing more slowly or whatever. She stuttered and couldn't help it, no matter what she tried to do or not do. Sometimes the words came out fine, but mostly they didn't. The room suddenly felt small and cramped. She glanced at the door. Sit down, said Nurse Nora, following her gaze and pointing at a stool. You're not going anywhere. Maggie watched her rummage through one of the cabinets and pulled down a large bottle of iodine and a jar of cotton balls. She unscrewed the cap with a high pitched squeak. The dark yellow liquid soaked into the soft white fluff like a filthy stain. This is going to hurt, she said. Maggie stared at her, at the smallness of her eyes and dabs of pale blue eyeshadow. You're a terrible nurse, she thought. You've never made me feel better about anything. She longed to snatch her hand away and run out. Nurse Nora took hold of Maggie's wrist and placed her fat fingers around the pencil. She tugged. There was a faint squelching, and the pencil came loose, releasing a gush of blood. Quickly, Nurse Nora pressed down hard with the soaked cotton ball, covering the open wound with iodine. Maggie stifled a scream as the sting raced up her arm, burning like fire. You know, I've always thought there was something wrong with you ever since you got here, Margaret. Nurse Nora fluttered her pale blue eyelids, apparently deep in thought. It's your voice, isn't it? You try to hide it. I've seen you in the playground sitting by yourself, not talking to the other children, even when they came up to you. It's not normal, not right. She transferred the pressure onto Maggie's good hand. Maggie felt a wave of nausea and thought she might be sick. Well, they can treat people with frozen mouth nowadays. Nurse Nora continued, the words shooting out of her like lead pellets. Maggie tried not to listen but the woman kept on. There are places, you know, special hospitals, institutions for the disabled. There's one in East London and it's very well respected. 
She reached for a metal tray containing several needles and a spool of dark green thread. I'm going to tell your parents about it. Granville Place, I think it's called. Maggie shuddered. She had heard of Granville. Tom Baker from St. Anne's had been sent there months ago because of his limp. Maggie remembered his mother at the school gates, all pink-eyed and teary. Everyone had talked about it. One of his friends had been to see him and claimed that kids were being locked into cupboards for crying and strapped down to their beds. He said the doctors had sounded all caring and nice to the parents, but on the inside it was a nightmare, with children so hungry they had to eat grass and toothpaste to keep themselves from starving. Grass. Nurse Nora cleared her throat. She tapped a needle on the side of a metal tray. It made a soft pinging sound. She held it up between her thumb and forefinger. It's not right, she went on, threading the needle, for somebody like you, Margaret, to be put in a class with properly behaved children. It's disruptive, and this, well, this is quite simply the final straw. Maggie turned her face away and looked out the window. She did not want to give Nurse Nora the satisfaction of seeing that her words hurt, even more than the pain in her hand. Now then, don't move. Nurse Nora squeezed Maggie's finger and lifted the needle. Maggie clenched her good fist. She had never had stitches before. She stared at the grimy raindrops as they broke and trickled down the glass. And once again, from somewhere deep inside her heart, she felt the howl of wanting to be exactly like everyone else, to speak without stuttering, to say whatever she wanted to say, to be understood, to be heard. The needle went in. And that's the end of chapter one. You can see just from that chapter how horribly Maggie is treated because of her stutter, not only teased by the kids in her class, but by the adults around her, by the school nurse. And eventually her parents do hear about Granville and that's where her father wants to send her. She's made to feel as if she's deeply flawed for having this stutter. Throughout the book, we get to know Maggie and realize she's compassionate, she's caring, she's an independent thinker. She has so much to say and the world needs to find a way to listen to her. This was such a great book. The forest itself really played a character. The writing is beautiful throughout. It's enchanting, it's moving. There's a lot of emotion in this book. Maggie and her grandfather end up having a wonderful relationship. And that was one of my favorite parts of this book. I really loved the way that Maggie found someone to support her. And that gave her the strength to go out and support what was important to her. The book is also filled with beautiful illustrations done by Diana Sujika. Between the chapters, there are full page drawings of the forest and sprinkled throughout, there are leaves and acorns and other details from the story that really kind of add to the magic. It's a really beautiful book and it's a really great story about the natural world and the animal world and the human world all coming together to connect, told through these two voices, this animal voice and this voice of the little girl. I highly recommend that you read Wild Oak by C.C. Harrington. Thank you for joining me.